Hi everybody, I'm glad you're joining me today where I'm going to talk about your imagination, which is not imaginary, but it is actually the source of all the miracles and works of God that you are anticipating God to do. It's through your imagination that these things actually occur. That is the root of the matter, and unfortunately, uh, there are some false teachings, false doctrines out there, uh, you know, of which I am not an expert in, but I think one of them is probably New Age and that sort of thing where, you know, people imagine things and, you know, therefore, because it's of that camp, Christians steer away from that. Oh, you can't talk about imagination. That's just, you know, blasphemy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm sure that's maybe an extreme word, but uh, people, you know, that is essentially, that is what hope is. Hope is a great, confident expectation of God with joy. You know, you are so confident that of what God has promised and it's built up in you this dream, this vision of what God will and will and has done for you in Christ. And so just another way to term that really is imagination and it, that is really the work of the Christian is keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus and through our fixing our eyes on him that the godly hope is birthed in us. And we'll be talking about that later on. Let's just go first to the word and you can see for yourself that the word for imagination is a godly thing. It's right there in the Word. So let's go to Isaiah 29, verse 16 here. And here it says, and I'm not really going to jump into the theology of it, but I want to zero in on a word. And of course, this is talking about God, the potter, and we are the clay that are formed, of course, by our potter, our heavenly potter. And it says, surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? For shall the thing made say of him who made it, he did not make me? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? And the point I want to make here is this amazing word, the thing formed. It may seem trivial, but we're, we are talking about creating your world, walking in your divine destiny and purpose. And how do you walk in the thing, the things formed for you that God has ordained you to walk in? And if we look at that word, it's this word right here. Uh, Strong's number 3336, and it's, I think, pronounced Yatzer. But let's go and zoom in on the Strong's Dictionary for that. And as you can see, right off the bat, it's not only a thing formed or framed, is another translation, but imagination. That is the same word as thing framed or conception okay conception is the very first stage of anything isn't it so we got imagination mind okay so your imagination as we commonly frequently say is your imagination it's your will your memories your emotions your dreams so we are talking about the mind here that is the thing framed. That is your work. Okay? <laughs> that is just, isn't that one little word, quote unquote little word, isn't that just so profound? 
It's all those things. That's your work. This is the challenge of the Christian, as I say a lot, is what are you thinking? You know, what are you wrapping your mind around? Are you thinking on the good promises of God that he has already laid up for you to enjoy? Or are you worrying? Are you reasoning away the amazing gospel and saying, oh, well, that's just impossible that's just too far-fetched. I can't believe that. You know, are you, or are you just listening to other voices? You know, the, the doctors and your family members or the news or, you know, fill in the blank. Other voices that frame your thoughts. Your imagination literally does. It is the frame of your life. You know, think of a frame. It's got the borders. It is your box. You know how we, a lot of times we say, you know, get God out of your box. You know, let him, let him free. <laughs> let God out of the box. Well, you can't let God out of your box until you're willing to think bigger, to imagine bigger. You, you are the bottleneck. As some pe some people say, you know, that's bottleneck is a way of saying that that's where the buck stops. You know, that is the one point where everything is locked to, locked into. That is the that is what you could say the uh, thermostat of your life. You know, do you have your thermostat set really low? In other words, is your bar really low? Or are you raising that thermostat, you know, so God can do all kinds of things because you are so confident he can do what he has promised. And we'll be talking about that later, too, <laughs> you know, about how to walk and improving your, your imagination and your hope, your expectation. But right now, I just want to definitely nail this home that your imagination is the crux of the matter. And of course, Jesus really is the crux of the matter. But as far as your work, you know, you personally, your, your input to this whole walk of faith, if you're not willing to imagine the truth, you know, see you walking out the promises of God. You know, when God says, by his stripes, you were healed. You know, don't just glance over that scripture and say, oh, that's so pretty. Let me put that in cross stitch and, and put it on the wall somewhere. <laughs> I mean, that's great. Of course. I mean, I got Bible verses all over the place in my house too. But let's get it in our heart first, because that's where it works. You know, it doesn't work on the coffee table, but it works in your heart. We got to get it in your heart, right? So we meditate, right? We think on these things. We imagine ourselves literally doing it. You know, if, if your hope and expectation is to have... Um, you know, God has laid it on your heart to be... Uh, some kind of ministry, some kind of uh, maybe an orphanage, something like whatever, you know, whatever you're God-given, that's the, that's the crux of the matter, your God-given dream, th see yourself walking in that, you know, dream it, take time, take time to ima just imagine yourself in that, that is your work. Like it says right there, imagination, the thing formed. It, that actually plays a huge, 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 huge part of forming that thing in your life. If you can't first think it, then you won't have it. This is not a mechanical work of faith. You know, you, where you just check the boxes. See, God, I said that. I prayed that. Okay, why isn't it done? You got to actually see it done. You got to imagine 
and and walk with the same spirit of faith that God has. This is how God walks by faith too. You know, he would be uh, unfair <laughs> to to ask us, born of God, to walk by faith when he doesn't. You know, we are we are cut of the same cloth. So God, of course, Jesus had to. He had to walk by faith. He had to learn that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. Do you think he came out of the womb and he... Bam, he knew everything and he could see the cross and where he was going. No, he he learned that through the scriptures and he imagined, he saw, he saw himself in the scriptures very literally. And we do the same. We do the same. And let me just show you how God uh, created us. You know, we are a work of his faith. How did God create us? How did, how did he did he just just say it? Or where did it really 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 start? Where did our creation? Remember that word yetzer? It literally is conception. Conception. That speaks of the very first stage, doesn't it? So we want to conceive the miracle first in our hearts through our imagination, just as God did when he created us. Let's go to Psalm 139, verse 16, and I'm going to read this specifically in the King James Version because there's parts of it that are definitely not shared in the other translations. And it says, Thine eyes did see my substance being yet unperfect, or you could say unfinished or unformed. And in thy book all my members were were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So this is speaking before you ever came forth. This is speaking of how God created you. He first saw you with his eyes of faith before you were ever formed. And so that is exactly how we walk by faith too. When we, we see the finished work of Christ in all and in and through all the promises of God in our lives, in our imagination first, that's where we first conceive the miracles is we see in our mind's eye it through our and in our imagination the finished work, even though it's not in the physical yet perfected. You know, it's not completed yet. And as it says here, it's even in his book. God has books in his word, you could say, because we were all formed in Christ, right? Everything that you can see was brought forth through and in Christ. So that's what it's referring to is in thy book. All my members were written. So God included us in Christ before we ever even knew him. Before we were ever a sparkle in our parents' eyes, (laughs) so to say. And so just look at this. We were fashioned when there was none of them. You know, when our days were already established through God's faith. That that is so he he is the grand designer and planner. And he saw all of us and all of our days and all of our members, you know, just every part of our being in his mind's eye before they were ever even formed. So we have to see with our imagination too, 
those things completed also in the same way. Because we are with the same spirit of faith, just as God has. So maybe that's why walking by faith may seem frustrating for you, maybe. You know, this is a big, big, big part of the puzzle of life. Walking in uh, the divine destiny that God has already designed and planned for you to walk through. It's already been done. It's already been written in his books, so to say, right? He saw your members already formed. And in context there, it's talking about being knitted together in your mother's womb. So he's, he is such the intricate designer that he knew all your bits and pieces you know, I'm not going to get all the scientific information that I I really do enjoy to get into, <laughs> to be quite honest. Uh, but God saw all those things that are just so way over our heads. Nobody can understand all the complexities that our amazing bodies that have been designed by God to work so so well, so efficiently. I mean, nobody, you know, nobody can create a human body from scratch. Only God can do that. He's the grand designer. And he saw first. That was where he conceived you was in his mind's eye first and then all those details were, so to say, written down in his books, included in Christ, right? So we can see here, speaking of which, uh, being God's creation, it says here in Ephesians 2 verse 10, in the New, Tra- uh, New King James Version, that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that, I would say, that is a paraphrase of the verse that we just read in Psalms 139, that God's work was to see us created in Christ Jesus. The That's the books, right? The Word made flesh, Christ Jesus. And he saw us in him, in Jesus, before our members were ever physically formed, right? And that word workmanship, I just love it. In the New Living Translation, it says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Or you could say before we ever existed, right? So he planned for us. Just, you know, think about the creation story, right? In Genesis where God brought forth the sun and the moon and the trees and the animals. And, you know, he at the Garden of Eden, he established and provided for everything that humanity would ever need in advance. He's a good planner. He always provides before you ever need it. It's, he's a, he just, he thinks at the end from the beginning. That's how he plans. That's how, you know, a good designer, that's how they design. You know, when you go to school and learn, you know, engineering or design work, architecture, you you look at the, you get the blueprint and you imagine what you want it to look like when it's all done. This is what I want to see when it's all finished. And then you work backwards. 
you say, oh, well, we're talking about four buildings instead of one. So with four buildings, you're going to need, you know, 400 square foot of uh, lumber, right? Instead of 100. Because that's what determines what you need, is what is the finished work. So that's the same way, really. I mean, we didn't think up that ourselves, that, that methodology. That skill comes from God. God is the original planner and designer, and he completed the work already in Christ. He knows the end, that we are going to be conformed to his image in Christ, period. That's a done deal. It's already been established, foreordained for us to walk in. And it will benefit us if we will link up with him and believe that truth and start imagining and seeing ourselves in that finished work. And when you start seeing yourself in that finished work of Christ, that you are included in that destiny also, of course, then you will see the miracles that are involved in that. Because, of course, we're talking about living the supernatural life, not the normal, you know, same old, same old life, boring, blah, kind of life. I'm talking about living the Christ life, which is supernatural, where God has called us to, like we just read right there in Ephesians 2, verse 10, these amazing works that he's ordained for us to walk in. Not only our bodies are masterpieces of his imagination, but even the works ourselves, the works that we will walk in, supernatural works and I guess that's a big mouthful today too because there's people that say oh well that's that's from way back when you know we're we're over the days of miracles that's past uh that's baloney <laughs> that's baloney Jesus I could simplify that uh ridiculous argument by just saying Jesus is the same today yesterday, and forever. And so if Jesus, who lives in us, and has called us to let him live through us, he's going to be doing the same things through us that he did when he walked here on the earth in the flesh. Period. And we got verses, many verses, John 14, 12, one of which to stand on in that regard, that we are called to live miraculous, supernatural lives. And it doesn't happen until you first start seeing yourself in the Bible verses. The Bible, all those uh, wonderful promises, which we will be talking about, not all of them, but I'm talking about increasing and walking in your hope, your expectation. We will talk about that later. But it begins with first knowing what you've been promised. You can't imagine, have godly imagination if you don't first know what's been promised to you, right? And it's so crucial and we can see you know, this point that I'm making that the miraculous doesn't happen until you first start seeing yourself walking in it, just as it was way back when, in the days of Noah, when when the, the Tower of Babel was being built. That's quite a tongue twister. So let's just read that, and you'll see a very important point there here in Genesis 11, I think it is, verse 6. Let's actually start with verse 4. And this is specifically in King James Version, because there's one word, as you can guess, that I'm going to zero in on. And it says, And they said, Go to, let's, let us build us a city and a tower, 
whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing, look at this, nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And so as the story goes, God came down and scattered their language so that they would not be of one accord, right? One mind, so that they wouldn't uh, boast in their ability to make a tower that reaches heaven, reaches to heaven, right? It's pretty clear why he scattered them because he didn't, they were boasting in and of themselves and God didn't, he, he resists the proud, right? But the most important point that I want to make right here is that God himself said that now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. That's huge. <laughs> you know, here's God saying, whoa, 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 we can't have them in, in their fallen state reaching heaven. That's not permitted. And so they were imagining that they could do this. And God was saying, uh, anything they imagine to do, it's going to be possible for them. Nothing's going to be restrained from them. Isn't that exciting? So the power is in your hands. It's in your heart, I should say, more specifically. What, what are you imagining? Are you imagining the worst? Are you imagining the best? The best outcome. And the good news is that God is on our side. God wants the very best for you. He wants a good, as it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, the famous I have a good plan for you, says the Lord, a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. If God's plan for us is that, well, then who are we to imagine something's negative and uh, we're going to lose, you know, fill in the blank, lose, quote unquote. No, God is for us. So who can be against us? And so open up the doors of your mind and let God come in, you know, let him expand your limits of your imagination and think big. Allow God to expand your expectation based on the promises, not based on what you see out here in the world and, you know, how it's fallen apart and there's all this corruption and you know, blah, 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 you know, who wants to hear all that and more? <laughs> no, we want to hear the good news, right? That, that sets us free. You know, knowing the good news is the power unto salvation. As it says in Romans 1, if your, if your salvation is dwindling, then you haven't heard too much of the gospel. The gospel itself, it's not just like a magazine or, you know, a history book. No, it's living. As it says in Hebrews 4 verse 12, the word of God is living. It's powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it can produce supernatural effects in your life if you allow it to and most importantly you got to hear it first right and that's what this is all about this teaching is you got to hear it you got to hear it to know it and it's a it's just like uh eating a meal every day you know you don't just eat a meal on on monday and say okay well i've done my duty i'm done i don't need to eat for another week <laughs> No, you eat uh, at least about three times a day, don't you? Well, in the same way, you know, Jesus said, my, my 
body is real food real food so you don't just dabble in it you know dabble in the gospel once a week for five minutes and think you've had enough it's supernatural it's a supernatural book and you need it every day to excel spiritually and and that not only you know you people may hear spiritual you know spiritual this spiritual that well it affects your natural life too so that you can live super naturally you know you can live above the circumstances of life not under them not be trodden down by the circumstances of life because as well as we were about to go to let's go there proverbs 23 verse 7 this is specifically in the king james version it says for as he thinks in his heart so is he i just want to focus on that alone that is that is so i say that frequently because it really is the crux of the matter you know you can have all these things laid up for you to enjoy but if you don't know them and you don't think about them you don't expect them and imagine them as we're talking about here today then you will not live them out live those promises out you won't god is restrained through your belief system it says in in the gospels that Jesus could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. That means it was their fault that he couldn't do miracles in such and such town. Because the people themselves refused to believe correctly. So your belief system is the crux of the matter. And most specifically, as we're talking about here, Let's imagine that is where the conception starts. Let's imagine the promises in our hearts coming to fruition. Not just, uh, like I said earlier, you know, putting it, cutting it out and, you know, putting a nice picture on the wall. No, it's got to be in your heart, right? And that takes time. That takes effort because there's lots of distractions out here in this world. Places to go, people to see, phone calls to make, etc., 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 etc. But we got to take time to imagine yourself in the finished work of Christ, whatever that looks like for you. That takes time to, to imagine yourself in that state, right? And you got to know the word first, you got to know the gospel. And, and as it said right there where we read, as a man thinks in his heart, as you think, or you could say as you imagine in your heart, so you will be. You will be that. If you think you're broke, busted, and disgusted, you will be that way. You need a higher power to overcome that negative influence that just kind of smears all over you from the world because the world's very negative. The world thinks, uh, you know, it's going to self-implode next year. <laughs> you know, they just think, oh my gosh, don't get me started. <laughs> but, so we need a higher, more powerful message than the 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 reports that come from the world, and that is the gospel. We think on what Jesus, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, and above all else, everything is beneath his feet. He is dominated the world system, period. And so we need to meditate on his position. His position is our position. We are, as it says in Ephesians 2, verse 6, seated in Christ at the right hand of the Father. We are in Christ, and so we are in a position of authority and victory. 
But if you don't believe it, it won't work for you. Like I said a moment ago, you know, it didn't work for such and such people because they refused to believe and Jesus couldn't do anything for them. Wow. You know, we a lot of times we like to say, well, Jesus can do anything. He's all powerful. Well, yeah, that's step one. <laughs> but there's other there's other uh, puzzle pieces to fit to that to that. And a big part of it is you. <laughs> you have to see yourself in the finished work of Christ for it to be of any good effect in your life. Because Jesus did it all, and now the ball's in our court. Simply put. Right? So we are bounded by what are we believing of the word. Are we, you know, that's where actually a lot of denominations spring up from. You know, they, they read cert, you know, certain things in the Bible, and they're like, ooh, yeah. I can't believe that. So we're going to call this church body that we're, I'm part of, we're going to call it now uh, the non-prosperity group. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's just so many good, juicy promises in the gospel. But if you don't believe them, then they're not going to work for you. You know, I mean, don't, don't. Don't skip over the the hard, when I say hard, verses. I'm talking about the verses that, you know, it's kind of challenging to your belief system that you've always believed, what you've always heard, you know. If God says, as it says, for example, in 3 John verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers okay let's use that as an example so if i just skip over that and say oh well no god wants me to suffer in this sickness so i can you know exalt him you know just just uh honor him through my disease uh no <laughs> See that's where I'm ta- that's what I'm talking about. Do you skip over that verse or do you receive it? And do you say that's right. God wants me healthy. It says right there I I pray above all things that you prosper. Oh oh, oh whoa whoa whoa. Now we're talking about prosperity. So that could be another denomination. You know, that's where you just oh, I can't have that. <laughs> so That's where you're limiting God is because you see verses like that and you're like, nope, 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 can't do that. That's outside my God box. So you want to open up the God box and you want to let all those challenging verses come on in, you know, come on in so that you can live the prosperous Christian life that you're called to enjoy. When you say, oh, no, 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 I can't have that. What you're doing is you are belittling the power of the blood of Christ. You're belittling the amazing work that he did for you on the cross. You're saying, oh, Jesus, I know you did all that for me, but ugh, yeah, I don't, I don't need that. That is, that is awful. I'm just, that's, I just got to say it. That's just terrible. You know, God paid an amazing price for you to enjoy an abundant life and for you to be, I'm not saying you per se, but I'm saying generally speaking out to you Christians out there everywhere, (laughs) when you say, no, I can't do that, that would just, that's asking too much of God. Well, he already did it. So just go ahead and receive it. Just receive it. You're honoring God by receiving those promises that he laid up for you to enjoy through Christ's finished work. He already did it. So why don't you go ahead and enjoy it? He wants you to enjoy that. He wants you to enjoy abundant health. 
So why resist him in that as an example? I probably should have taken a whole lesson just to talk about these different areas that people refuse to go there in their minds to imagine it coming to pass for them personally. Because there's lots of um, religious doctrine out there that says, you know, can't God can't do this and he can't do that. And, you know, it's just outside their God box, which you would call biblically religion it's a religious idea it's traditions of man just theories of mankind myths ideologies that contradict what's promised to us in the word and so we don't want to be like that you want to you want to get everything that god is laying up for you to enjoy when he gives you that wonderful juicy good steak with the mashed potatoes and overflowing gravy you know and then for dessert you know the double dutch chocolate cake and you know, I mean he's got a huge spread for you he doesn't have just some green beans on a little tiny plate for you here eat that no, that's not abundance. And if you read the Bible, the, the gospel, there, that word abundance, it is profuse. It's, it is many times mentioned, and it's one of my favorite words, in the New Testament. You know, abundance this, over the top that. You know, that's my version. So anyway... Let's, let's talk again about how your heart is, like I said earlier, the thermostat that determines the quality of your life. You know, like as you would a thermostat, if you put it down real low, well, then the temperature in the air is going to be real low. But if you raise that thermostat, well, then it's going to correspondingly draw on that furnace, man. You're going to put that furnace to work. And it's going to produce what you're expecting. You put in your expectation. You raise that thermostat. So the thermostat's kind of like a symbol of your expectation. And when you expect more, then you, what you're doing is you're putting a drawing on the spirit who is the source of these miracles but as long as you hold your bar really, 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 really low, then Holy Spirit really has nothing to work with. You want to raise the bar. You know, raise your expectation so that God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can ask or think. Notice that. You got to think it first right? And of course, it's according to the power that works in you. Well, how do you get, I'm really jumping ahead here, but how do you get that power working in you? Well, in a nutshell, you want to believe the gospel, you know, because the gospel is the one that will get, is the message, I should say, that gives you the good conscience. It, re, it removes that guilty conscience. It imparts to you a justified righteous soul you know your soul is made well your soul's not made righteous your spirit is but your soul has a purged conscience by the blood of Jesus Christ alone but if you are not aware of that and you're under the law you will suffer condemnation and guilt and therefore the power of God will be restrained because God works through a bold conscience that's been purged by the blood of Jesus Christ, by your awareness that you are a new, clean, pure creation of His. But as long as you're not, you're not aware of that and you think, well, God's got, you know, all He wants from me is a big, long to-do list, and of which I fall short in maybe 50% of them. You know, check, not check, cross, 
check, cross, you know, know, and all you're aware of is your to-do list. Well, that's not the gospel. The gospel is everything that Jesus has freely provided you by grace, by what he did on your behalf, not what you do for him. So that's how you get the power working in you. That's how you stay plugged in to the power source so that whatever you're thinking and imagining will come to pass. Because you realize, as Jesus is, so am I in this world. You know, is Jesus broke, busted, disgusted, sick? No. Well, neither am I. Because all my source of life comes from him. And as Jesus is, so am I in this world. As it says in 1 John 4, 17. Right? So where I wanted to go was, let's go to Proverbs 4, verse 23. So here in the King James Bible, and it says, Keep thy heart... With all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Okay, that's huge right there. For out of it are the issues of life. And what that word issues, of course, we know what life is. Okay, but issues is this, I'm not going to even try and say it. It's this word here that means boundary, outgoings, like as in goings forth. It's the borders. It's the source. Okay, so your heart is the source and the boundary. It's where everything goes forth from. Everything. Everything. So if your heart is contaminated with, you know, poisons, so to say, which would be religious doctrine, you know, uh, myths and, and lies of the enemy, just plain out lies because you don't know the word. So that's how you can, you know, restrain lies from being effective in your life is you've got to know the truth better. So if your heart is contaminated with these things, then those boundaries, right? As it said there, what proceeds out of your heart are the boundaries of the quality of your life. So if your quality of life is very restrained, that means the boundaries in your heart are missing the God factor, essentially, you, you haven't allowed God in, which by definition, God is big. <laughs> so if you let God and his word and his promises into your heart, he, wa- he wants this for you and that for you and this for you and that for you. And you're like, yes, 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 yes. So you just open up your heart and it just gets so full So your boundaries are really, really, really wide. And that means your life force is going to be huge, right? But if your quality of life is real, it's just like dribbling out. Well, then that means your boundaries have gotten way abnormally narrow. Kind of makes me think of, you know, when you get... Heart disease, you know, atherosclerosis, I think is the word for it, you know, where it says your your arteries narrow down. It's because they've gotten, they've gotten harder. They've gotten hardened. And that's just so symbolic spiritually. You know, just taking that physical example and, and making a point spiritually that your heart can get hardened spiritually when you are hardened to the voice of God. You know, as it says in Hebrews 4, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts against the truth. So I'm I'm sharing these 
these ideas, these these promises of, of your salvation in Christ. And when you say no, 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 well, you're hardening your heart. You're restricting God and you're restricting your boundaries of your heart in, from being effective to produce the abundant life which flows from your heart, not from God's heart. Of course, the source is always God. You know, I'm not saying we're producing life from ourselves and in of ourselves, but God's per- given us all everything that pertains to abundant life in Christ already. And now we just decide, you know, as it says in Deuteronomy today, I place before you life and death. Choose life. <laughs> Where's that choice happen? In your heart. So you want to imagine and, and you know, choose the truth and imagine yourself in that finished work because it will either expand upon the the quality of life that you have or restrict it those boundaries of your life the quality of your life are determined by what you think as it says right there be diligent let's go back to it Keep your heart with all diligence. Your heart is your belief system. Your heart is where imagination occurs. So when you say, when it says, keep your heart with all, not some diligence, not, you know, when you think about it. No, be determined, be diligent and watch what you're thinking. If it doesn't line up with the truth, then be adamant. Be firm and cast that down with the truth because the truth is your offensive weapon. You know, you can't just say, oh, I won't think that. I won't think that. No, I won't think that. No, get the truth out. Get the promises out and say, no, God doesn't say I'm going to die an early death. He said that he's the strength of my life. So if God's the strength of my life. Is he dying? No. Well, neither will I, you know, so you get the truth out and that's what knocks those lies down flat on their face, so to say, right? So that's where it's at right there, your heart. And as an example, I wanted to share, you know, as the, the definition there of the issues of life, that your heart is where that occurs, your God box, so to say, right? It's the boundaries, it's the box. That's your heart. Your God box, your quality of life with God is determined by your God box. Not my God box, but yours. You know? So if your God box is really teeny tiny, well then that's going to restrain God from working in your life because of what you're thinking. Not because of God. Not because of me, not because of, you know, you name it, but because of what you're thinking, what you're imagining and expecting, right? So as an example for all you football fans out there, or I guess you could use this for basketball too, but let's just say, you know, we're talking about a game here where, you know, you're trying to get the goal But as long as you step out of bounds, well, then that's when the timer stops. The game stops, so to say. Yeah, there is no chance for making a goal, making a, you know, making a hoop. (laughs) You know, I mean, you are restrained, even that game, even in a game, you are restrained by the boundaries you know, the game stops, the, the time clock stops whenever the uh, athlete steps out of bounds. And so that, that is very symbolic of our heart boundaries. You can't, you can't live, you can't um, fake 
living outside your heart. Your heart in and of itself has its own boundaries. It's just that's how it's made by God. He gives you your belief system and then it's up to you how you want to develop your boundaries. And th those boundaries can be expanded upon as you put your nose into the word and you find out all those juicy, good promises that are given you in Christ. And you're like, wow, and it blows your boundaries out. So you, you don't even, I mean, they're so wide, you can't even perceive where the ends are. You know, you don't, you don't want to say, you don't want to have a tiny, tiny God box where it's like, ah, no, I don't believe that. And I don't believe that. And I don't believe that. And no, let God in so you can live an abundant life. Right? So I hope this was an encouragement to you that uh, the buck stops with you. Not with God. He's already done every good thing in Christ for you. And so now it's all up to you. What are you going to imagine? Because that is the source of you being able to live a miraculous, supernatural life. Is what are you imagining in your heart? Because if the truth applies to those back there in the Tower of Babel... It certainly applies to us because we're all made in his image. We're all humankind. You know, he created us all with this capacity of a heart that can imagine things. And that's whereby how we live. We always live by our heart, right? Out of our heart. That's what, pro and we'll talk about that next time. That is what propels you to what you do, how you live your life. So we'll, we'll talk about how to improve and uh, expand. And I've already really did have begun to touch on that here, how to grow in your expectation and in your imagination. Okay, next time. So I hope you all have a wonderful week and I look forward to sharing with you again. Bye-bye. Hi, you all. I just wanted to say a quick thank you. Thank you for to all my partners out there with this ministry. And I appreciate your prayers and your offerings that you have been sending. And I just want to send you much love and appreciation for all that you do and the kind words that you share and just when the times you do reach out to me. And I just I appreciate the the connection very much. So, um, by the way, for all of you all, I, I don't say this hardly ever. So I'm making a point to share the fact that there is a link on my website that's in the slide following that shows you where you can mail or use PayPal if you're interested. Just want to make sure you knew that. So you all have a blessed week and I look forward uh, to next time.